Welcome to the studio. As you know, my name is Yaku. If you're new here, welcome. Let me shake my hand. Let me shake my hand. I've been in the workshop working as a goldsmith for many, many years, and we try and share all of that experience. If you're watching a lot of our videos, you probably know that this is our intro. <laughs> We're trying to give back from our site, from what we've learned, from the craft that we love, and we could try and give it back to you. So we read the comments and people are, are learning and they're appreciating it. So thank you very much for those folks who comment. And if you do comment and share, please like and subscribe as well. All right, let me explain what we're working with today. Customer came in with a pendant, really lovely, classic. What was it again? Uh, aquamarine. Aquamarine, yeah. Expensive stones these days, aquamarines now. Yes, yeah, Especially with this size. Lots of diamonds going around the side, really in no way a bad piece of jewelry, a beautiful pendant, but what was the problem to my? They didn't want it to be a pendant anymore. They maybe didn't wear it as a pendant. Anyway, let me show you what I've done. The main thing that you need to remember about pendants are that they're usually quite flat at the back. They don't make them with a curve for a ring. So we have to do something about this so we can sort that out. We don't want the flat piece on the finger because it's not perfectly round. I guess you could do it. It's not gonna be wrong. But again, in my workshop, I'm looking at it as if I manufactured this from the beginning. I wanted this to be a perfect ring. I didn't want people to look at it and go, wow, that's a beautiful pendant that was changed into a ring. I'm always gonna try, and this is really because I've been in the trade for so long, I'm going to give you an idea of what the length and the thickness is, as well as the weight of the metal that I'm working with so that you can get an idea of costs when you're trying to do something like this yourself. A big top like this, typically on a finger, what it tends to want to do is slide to the sides. It moves around a lot because you've got all that weight at the top and we don't want that weight to be constantly leaning towards the one side or the other side. You'll notice if you're looking at the shape of the shank, my solution to try and get the most balance of the ring not moving around is by leaving a little bit of excess at the bottom corners. It helps that the ring has actually got some substance, some weight at the bottom. When the ring starts turning, it sort of gives you a little nudge at the bottom and you can, you can correct it that way. So I'm flattening up the sides, I'm bending the ring round and I'm cutting it. I'm leaving an enormous amount of sizes between where I'm now to where I want to end up because I'm going to be hammering this ring into shape. And every time I compress the metal, it flattens, it spreads. So I'm achieving my size by hammering the shape into the ring itself. So I flared out the edges, I bent the ring round, cut through and soldered it. and I created a little blob of 18 karat just on the desk, not in casting it into an ingot or anything, just on the desk. Now, if you look at the back of this pendant, you'll see that there's a big load of wiring coming from a single oval area. That's a flat area. So I'm creating a little oval that mirrors the small oval underneath the setting, but I'm going to bend that into the size that I'm looking for, which is the size N. So I have a basic framework. Hope you're still with me. always anneal the ring and flatten it again with my punch. I'm breaking that angle where it used to be straight like this and where I flatten it, I'm breaking this angle to make everything flat. I'm trying to achieve something that when I put the ring down or turn it around flat on a piece of metal that I've got no air underneath it, no gaps underneath it. 
If I have any gaps, typically I would file those away, but we try and eliminate the filing because that's where we get our losses from. So I'm trying to bring it to a point. I'm trying to force it to a point as I'm working to make sure that I can have the minimum amount of filing. That's just a good way of working. I guess this is today's Goldsmith Workshop Secret. So as I'm going along and it's squashing out towards the sides, I'm taking my file and I'm removing that sort of excess it squeezes on. Remove it and then hit it again. Remove it and hit it again. So I'm trying to maintain this shape that I've created. I'm using the little oval framework structure that I've made to measure what space it takes up by holding it towards the bottom of the ring and making two little marks. I always work inside that so that once I've cut it and it doesn't fit, I can then slowly open it up so that when I bring that section down that it eventually lands exactly where I want it to land. So the next step is for me to cut open those areas, look at the angle that we've worked with. It has a slanted angle like this. Typically it's towards the center of the ring once you've bent it like that and I'm working towards the center and I'm filing at the same rate. I'm filing away this way and that way, either side, and dropping that section in slowly until it reaches exactly the bottom of the ring. I want it to look like these two parts belong to that little section I've just made. So by making it the same height and scrubbing it down, and then also then from the point where I start, by marking an end point, I can determine that I've cut in this direction and cut in that direction, that both of those splits will be exactly the same length. Now I turn my attention to the side of the ring. So the bottom has got its shape, the top is mounted, and now I'm looking at the sides. Now, I just flatten this stuff. There's no shape to it at this moment, but I can guide the shape of the outside with what we've just achieved, meaning we've got our framework, we've got the little cuts. So there's detail over there that we can now take to the outside. So I'm putting my ring onto I've got the GRS bench mate over here and there's a section that you can tighten it up so I'm supporting the inside of the ring. While I'm supporting the inside of the ring, I'm bringing in a graver, which is nice and polished on the side, squeezing it in and turning it up. Once I've got a little bit of leverage there, so I've just moved them away, enough for me to get a set of pliers in there and I'm using a round, round plier to twist them, to curl them. This will give me the effect that it turns upwards. I'm refining the shoulders now. And I'm refining the shoulders and I'm bringing it down to balance what I've done with the rest of the ring. This is not something that you're going to see on a picture. This is a feel. Use your eye, make sure that you've got a nice balance and know when to stop. The shape will start developing as you're working.
the oval section where the wings, where the, where the cluster is going to sit on is still rounded. The section that sits on the fingers round, but I want a little bit of a flat surface over here because we want more real estate. We want more space for the solder to really hold back down on it. So I flatten the cluster itself and then I file a flattened area. Not much. I'm not going down on, on the thickness of this thing. I'm just putting a little bit more of a file on there so that my contact points aren't just on the point where it touches, but it can rest on something that's absolutely flat. This is all in preparation on making sure that I've got as much strength out of this ring that I can possibly can get. Because look what it's housing. Look at that size, look at the size of this aquamarine, guys. Aquamarines don't take heat, so we're not going to work with this anywhere close to a flame. I'm gonna remove the aquamarine out of the section so that I can freely work with the, uh, with the setting itself, seat that into the ring to make this all one piece, and then bring the aquamarine back. Of course, I'm pre-polishing into these little corners because there are areas that I'm not gonna be able to get into, and I will really help to pre-polish before we do the soldering, which is exactly what I've done. And on top of that, I'm using boracic powder mixed with a little bit of uh, isopropyl alcohol. Mix that up, up so it's cloudy, and pre-burn it. Hmm? It's pretty. A pretty green flame. <laughs> <laughs> the green flame you're seeing is there to create a coating over the material so that it also uh, it helps with the tarnishing when I'm busy working with it. quickly ran around the diamonds, made sure that none of them are loose, reset the aquamarine and worked off the entire ring and finest fine sandpaper and gave it a really beautiful polish. We have a ring. We had, a, we had a pendant, now we got a ring. It's magic. Yeah, we've taken something and we completely gave it another kind of like function. And you can do that with jewelry. Guys, it's been fantastic and it's also been very hot. Yeah. It's ridiculously hot. We're I mean, I've gone back in some of my videos, right? And I see myself sitting there, we've got, like, speaking like this and it's like really cold. cold. It's a hot one today, man. And it is as hot as it gets in England at the moment. I might do like a, a flame green screen. <laughs> I might do it right now. Pretend that you're burning. Ah! Ah! Till next time. Cheers. Bye, guys. Cheers. <laughs>